Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Savvy Strategies for Continuous Online Engagement. My name is Colleen Mannion, Senior Manager of Demand Gen at Ruffalo and Noah Levitz, and I will be your host for today's webinar. I have a few housekeeping notes to go over before the webinar starts. First, if at any point you experience technical difficulties joining the WebEx, please dial the number located in the chat box. As an attendee, you're automatically muted on entry and by default, your audio will stream through your computer. If you would prefer to dial in, please click on the telephone icon located on the participant panel. And I encourage you to ask questions throughout today's webinar by submitting them in the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen and we'll have time at the end of the webinar to answer your submitted questions. And one final reminder that you will receive the recording and slides of this webinar within a week. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to our first presenter for today, Todd Abbott. Todd? Thank you, Colleen. And uh, good morning to uh, all of you today out on the West Coast, and uh, which is where I'm based. And uh, good afternoon for those of you in the, in the Midwest and, and back East as well. Um, really excited about today's, uh, today's webinar in, in large part because I, I get an opportunity to, uh, to finally present uh, in, a, in a webinar with, with my, my friend and partner, Gil Rogers. Um, but real quickly, just a quick background uh, for those of you um, who want to know about me. Uh, I've been with, uh, been with Ruffalo and Olevitz for a little over 12 years. I am uh, currently the Senior Vice President for Strategic Partnerships. And um, my background, I've been in enrollment management for over 20 years. Um, it's something I'm, I'm fairly passionate about and, uh, again, pretty excited around today's, today's topic with Gil as well. So before we get going um, in, uh, in showing the agenda and all of that, I'm gonna toss it over to Gil real quick, let him introduce himself and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Gil. Uh, and thank you everyone for taking the time to, to... I'm the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Strategic Partnerships for Platform Q Education. Uh, really excited to be a partner with Ruffin Olevitz as we, as we look at ways that we can better support uh, continuous online engagement strategies with students throughout the funnel. Um, a little of my background for those that, <laughs> that as Todd, would say, Todd said, want to know. Uh, I've been uh, at Platform Q Education for a little under a year. Um, I've been in the ed, ed tech and digital um, strategy space for probably about 10. Uh, and prior to that, I worked in enrollment at uh, a couple of regional private schools in the Northeast. Uh, admissions counselor at the University of Hartford, and then I worked at the University of New Haven in Connecticut for about eight years. Uh, really excited to be here to talk about uh, ways that we uh, might, that we're thinking we talk about supporting students throughout the process, um, leveraging uh, different technology pro programs and also uh, different strategies. So really happy to be here. That's great. Thanks, Gil. Um, so today's, uh, today's agenda, and, and no, I, I won't, um, I won't sing the song, but uh, as Gil and I were thinking about this and, and sort of putting together today's agenda and today's slide deck, we thought about the uh, sort of that, that children's fable, there's a hole in the bucket, uh, dear EM pro, dear EM pro. So um, I, Gil's got some really, uh, I, I think, some insightful sort of ways which all of us in enrollment management, marketing, communications, um, are sort of working with and, and to, a, uh, to a degree sort of dealing with the changes today in, in how we market and recruit uh, prospective students. Um, so from there, we'll, we'll sort of migrate into how do we plug the holes? How do we plug the holes in this, in this sort of large bucket of, um, of student recruitment and marketing that we do? We've got, I, I think, really um, three really good examples from institutions who are doing some things that, that we believe um, uh, and we can see have done some um, very innovative kinds of things along the way that have really helped them in sort of their approach with prospective students. And, uh, and for those sticking around to the end, um, we, we think it's a fun surprise for sticking with us until the end, <laughs> or at least Gil and I do. Um, was, we'll see if that's the case or not. So with that, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rogers and um, we'll, let, we'll let him take it from here. 
Awesome. Yeah, and it is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Um, I was in, I, I live in Maine, and I work uh, from my home office, and yesterday I was looking out my window to snow all day, and today I'm looking at sun. So it truly is a beautiful day in the neighborhood. I just need to get a nice sweater like that to, to keep warm. Uh, so uh, Todd mentioned, you know, the, the children's fable, there's a hole in the bucket, right? And if you're not familiar, I actually feel like we have to explain this a little bit, Todd, because there might be folks on the, on the call who are not familiar with this song. Um, the, sure. the, the old adage goes, um, you know, the, the, the song goes, you know, there's Henry who has this bucket that has a hole in it and Liza who is telling him how to kind of fix the hole in that bucket, right? And so as the song goes, she tells him to go get some straw to plug the hole in the bucket, but the straw is too long, right? So he needs to cut the straw. Um, how does he cut it with a knife? But the problem is that the knife is too dull. So she tells him to sharpen that, the knife. So with what? With a stone, but the stone is too dry, Liza, right? So which, what she tells him to do then is to get make the stone wet. What do you get it wet with? With water, right? But how do I get water? Liza tells Henry to go get water with a bucket. And of course, there's a hole in the bucket, right? So that that's that that's the vicious cycle that we think you know we we're in a lot of times with enrollment marketing and enrollment and in admissions is you know we have a similar type of a problem. We have we want to fill uh, you know our class with a bunch of great students that are a great fit for our institution. We so we go out and we get lists for these students and, and identify markets to market to those students who put those students in our funnel. Uh, and then we use different tools to reach those students. We, we start maybe with some direct mail pieces, uh, but that direct mail alone is a great way to in, maybe introduce our brand, but is not necessarily a sharp enough tool to do that. So we do things like phone calls to, to reach out and re-engage students. We'll do things like emails to continue that engagement process. And we keep adding new ways to try to reach these students with things like digital marketing and, and text messaging to, to provide, you know, initial other ways to, to, to reach our class. But at the end of the day, the problem is, is that there's still a hole in our bucket, right? We still have a problem where we're seeing, we're not seeing the results at the bottom of the funnel that we're used to with respect to trying to engage our class. So when we think about the, the engagement process, you know, this is, this is what we've experienced over the past few years. I know when I was on the admission side of the desk, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, we had, you know, the, the, the opportunity was, you know, what we would do is we'd go out and buy our lists from, from data providers, and then we would, you know, we would know how many names we need to buy because the bottom of the funnel was somewhat predictive, right? We knew that if we needed X number of admitted students and our admit rate was Y and our yield rate was Z, we would kind of be able to back, backfill with some, some algebra of how many names we need to buy as part of our process. Of course, there was travel and other things as a part of this, but that was, that was our starting point for marketing to our class. The challenge that we've seen, and, and Todd and I have talked a lot about this, is that you know, over the past 15 years or so, the, the funnel has changed, right? The, the amount of resources that we can use to, to put our, our name in front of students has, has exploded. The data providers are still there, but they're one source in a, in a variety of different sources and methods for reaching students. There's digital marketing, there's social media, the common application. And what we're finding is that even with, you know, the proliferation of tools like CRM systems, which are meant to automate a lot of processes and make our lives easier, yield has dropped by as high as 50 percentage points across various sources. And we also know, and we also see that, you know, and this is data from the U.S. Department of Education, that the number of applications that an institution has to generate for one single enrollment has doubled over the past 15 years. So essentially, we're doing double the amount of work for the same net result that we were 15 years ago, even with all of these additional tools and resources. Uh, Todd, do you have anything you want to add here? Um, well, other than it, listening to that, I, I actually just got um, mildly depressed of, of, how, of how difficult it's become. Um, I, I I think about all of the all of the changes that have occurred in in the time that I've been in enrollment management and into one. I, you know, Gil and I have talked about um, sort of the this proliferation as he talks about sort of the of different name providers and, and digital marketing opportunities and the CRMs. And to me, um, in in many respects, the the CRM piece of all of this is a is a big. Um, you know, sort of conversation piece to all of this that we have had, at least at RNL, for at least the last five, six years, and and you know, it, it's been used as sort of a, hey, I've got a CRM, I'm good to go now. But in a lot of cases, to us, you know, if it's not done well, then it's just another, again, to use sort of the analogy that we're using today, it's another hole in a really shiny bucket, and those are 
Um, those are some things that we want to continually sort of work with institutions on, um, you know, try as best as they can to sort of understand. And then it really, it's, you know, they sort of leverage this type of technology so that we all can be more efficient, get back to, um, you know, yield increasing um, in, in sort of this less reliance on completely doubling or tripling application numbers to get to that same number that we had 15 years ago. Awesome, great, in, great, great feedback. And so when, when we think about, you know, the, how do we evolve and how do we better support or how do we plug the holes in our bucket? I think the first thing we can, we can really think about is looking at the engagement process and looking at the recruitment process through the lens of students, right? And I think uh, we can all agree that one of the reasons why we're in enrollment management and in higher education is to, is to support student outcomes. So we, if we start at the, the thought process of the student, there's a number of things that we know based on research and frankly, just anecdotal interactions with students. You know, we know based on e-expectations research that over seven in 10 students watch videos from colleges. So video is a preferred platform or medium for consuming content. You know, we, we live in a world where students aren't only born with smartphones in their hands, but they're born with smartphones with the Netflix and Hulu app installed on their phones, right? And YouTube, obviously. Uh, so on top of that, we know that, you know, EDU branded content generally is rated as the most trusted source of college information by prospective students. If you think about from, you know, the variety of sources that, that students are able to engage with your content, there's college help sites, there's Google search results, uh, directories, those sorts of things. And those are, are useful and helpful for sure. But your website, the collateral you send with your brand on it are, are still typically rated as the most trustworthy because when you think about it, your EDU is the, is the official source of information, right? So it's of course gonna be trusted because it has the official content deadlines, um, requirements, all those sorts of things. The other piece to all of this is, you know, current students and counselors being rated the most influential connections that a student can make on campus. And this, I think, is, is something that is not new in the last 15 years at all. I think this is something that has been a consistent for as long as admissions has existed, it's, it's been a, a people business, right? It, it, the thing that's changed is how those connections happen. It used to be the only, the only time a student would be able to get time with an admissions counselor is with an appointment on campus. Then that kind of transition to, you know, admissions counselors visiting their high schools and going to college fairs. And then it turned into availability on social media. Now it's availability with texting. So there's different ways that students make connections with and, and, are, and, and are able to connect with current students and counselors at the institutions that they're, that they're considering. And so, on, you know, as part of this and thinking through this, you know, when we think about building the conduit platform, uh, which is the, the platform that that platform Q Education uses to support online engagement strategies, is we know that students are consumers too. And so what we try to do is we say, you know, we know students like video, we know they trust institutionally branded content, and the voice of the current student and admissions counselors are influential. How do we combine those truths together in a platform and an experience that's also easy to access and immediately accessible. So when we talk about the, the conduit platform, what we're really talking about is a combination of online event programs that include webcasting, social streaming, and live chats. Um, so on top of that, we also provide and support strategies for the use of this software. You know, you could use any type of platform for, for streaming or chat, et cetera, but if you don't have a good plan behind it, just like Todd mentioned before with CRM systems, if you don't have a good implementation plan behind the setup of your CRM, it just becomes a shiny bucket with another big hole in it, right? So, so when we talk about webcasting and streaming, there's multiple ways to enforce, and there, we had some questions ahead of time uh, before the presentation that we received that we'll, we'll talk about at the end as well, but we know that you know, live webcasts are not necessarily the only way that you want to engage students with video content. Uh, you might have a faculty member that you want to have present on you know, the College of Business that's only available at Tuesday at one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but the best time to present to a, a student audience is at you know, six o'clock at night on a Thursday, right? It's just one example. So you, you know, you leveraging the technology, you can do what we call Simulive, which is recording that content and then pre presenting it as a live presentation later. And the best way to, to provide that, that real engagement is then having an admissions counselor or student be available for a live chat accompanying that presentation. You know, we're living in a, I mentioned before, students are, are born with, with YouTube on their phones. 
uh, on-demand access to content is also important. You know, hosting a, webca a webcast on, on other software platforms, you have to go through all the effort of downloading the video, making it available after the fact, you know, sending out the links within a week after the presentation. What happens if, you know, Todd mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, you know, he's on the West Coast, I'm on the East Coast. What if you read your calendar invitation wrong and you think of presentations at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, but that's Eastern time, and you log in at 2 o'clock Central? You missed it, right? Same thing will happen with students. So promoting an online event is just different than an on-campus event or a regional event because of, because of those types of you know, need for access to have the content available after the fact. And then also making it accessible across social media, right? You know, we, we hear a lot of, uh, of people say, well, you know, I can reach students by streaming to Facebook Live. And, you know, you could use Facebook Live as, as a channel to, to, to present to, uh, to your audience. But, one, that's going to be mostly parents, right, because, you know, that's a, a bigger audience right now on that platform, which is fine if it's, it's used strategically. But the other piece to that is thinking about how to, you know, communicating outcomes. We're in an ROI-driven environment for our work as enrollment professionals. So how do we communicate outcomes when the only thing we can say is how many people viewed a presentation and how many people clicked the like button? That doesn't help you communicate the influence that it has on your enrollment. That doesn't fix the holes in the bucket, so to speak. So thinking about those strategies and how we put those things together, what our team can, does and supports is – building out these, these types of campaigns and strategies to support webcasting, streaming, and chats as part of an overarching strat campaign. And, you know, Todd and I were joking a little bit before the presentation today, you know, conduit by definition is a tube that connects two things together. There are no holes in a tunnel, right? If, there are, if, there, if there's a hole in the tunnel, then you evacuate it, right, because it's not working for you. So conduit really kind of helps plug those holes by creating a tunnel between throughout the process versus a, versus a, 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 a leaky bucket throughout the campaign. So that's a little bit about, about online engagement. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Todd to, to kind of introduce us to the idea of these, uh, these leading institutions and how we're, how we're, how we're seeing um, the adoption of online engagement as part of an overall campaign. Yeah, thanks, thanks Gil. Um, and I'll, I'll save the, uh, the comment about the channel for, for later. Um, <laughs> So we we've uh, we, we have done the the research and in the piece that uh, that we're really excited about um, from our end and and again going back to what what Gil indicated in terms of just the level of effort that really all of you in in attendance today are are sort of get to do or have to do to in, enroll prospective students onto your campuses. Um, what we're trying to do as best as we can is to, again, leverage all of these great sort of tools and, and products and solutions that you all have so that we can become um, more efficient in our, in our world and sort of how do we strategically tie these things together. Um, these on, the, the online engagement strategies is a really, really key piece to this. So when we went and did some research on this, those that um, that did align their online engagement strategies then with the broader sort of overall communication recruitment strategy for prospective students, we saw some pretty compelling results, quite honestly. If you see inquiry to application conversion rates were boosted by as much as 35%. Um, application completion rates, which really in the world that, that Ruffalo No Levitz lives in, this, this is the or one of the most important pieces to the overall uh, sort of funnel, if you will, or the bucket, and that is making sure that students actually complete their application. Um, but again, saw rates complete, uh, rates boosted by 26%. And then again, at the end of the day, what it is is it's about enrollments. We saw inquiry to deposit rates boosted by 7%. So again, aligning these different strategies, the online engagement strategies with, again, that broader sort of overall strategic plan as well, um, really allows some institutions to, um, to begin, again, as I would call it, sort of become more efficient and really allow for some pretty, pretty great enrollment results. So um, we've got, again, we've got three different institutions we're going to sort of walk through and kind of um, sort of how they approached it, how they used, again, these online strategies with, with the broader sort of strategic plan at their institution and the results from that. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll lob it back to you, Gil, and, and uh, let you take it from there. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Todd. And, and I think just a couple of thoughts there too. You know, every the strategies get better when they're aligned with you know the broader plan, right? I think about you know social media back in its infancy when it was first a part of a of an institutional's outreach. It was kind of like the new admissions counselor who just graduated is our is our Facebook guy, right? And he, he they're, they're or they're responsible for managing the social media. It's kind of a side of the desk project, and that's evolved over time. That that you know, digital marketing is a component of a an overarching strategy, which includes social media marketing, and it's part of the overall plan. Same thing probably goes with travel. I mean, Todd would know better. I'm not old enough to remember the first time we were uh, we were doing travel as part of the recruitment <laughs> plan. Um, but when you know, when Todd had his feet out of the bottom of his his Flintstones car visiting uh, visiting high schools, it was um, you know the, there was probably some learning as we go along element to this, right? Where it was, it, you know, it, it's better when you look at the data and what markets you should be going to and, and be, are focused on where you should be versus just visiting every high school that you can in every, every neighboring state, right? You could, you're, when you're more strategic about the efforts, you see better results. The same goes with online engagement planning. You know, any school could host a webinar, any school could, you know, put a chat widget on their website. It's much more impactful when you put a plan in place behind it to align it with overarching priorities. And and that's where again we're we're really focused on. Todd, you want to say you want to mention something? Well, I, I mean, I, I didn't quite use the Flintstone car way back when, but close <laughs> to it. But uh but what I, I, I was going to um sort of reemphasize in terms of what you you said and, and what we have experienced um a, a, a tremendous amount of over the last, in particular, I'd say three to four years, and you, you touched on on the social media, sort of the digital marketing aspect to it. Um, what, what I see is even in other instances where there, in fact, could be a uh, someone who is not fresh out of high school or fresh out of college who is going to sort of manage the social media aspect or the digital marketing um, uh, plan for that institution. What, what we see or have seen a lot in the past is uh, different facets of, of these strategies are from different offices around campus as well. So the digital marketing, for example, how often are all of you on your campuses? Is that done out of the marketing office across campus and not a part of your strategic enrollment plan that you've got that you're trying to manage as well? And um, you know, from from what we've seen, at least seven, eight out of ten times, that those are uh, you know two massive sort of strategies that are not coordinated in their approach with with prospective students. And uh, so that's that's one example, to sort of emphasize what what Gil had already indicated from there. So with that, Gil, I'll, I'll let you I'll I'll awesome. be quiet and I'll let you jump into <laughs> into this first strategy. Everything Todd Abbott adds to a webinar is of value, so I hope everyone's listening. Uh, so, <laughs> the, so when, when we talk about, so Todd mentioned we have three different strategies. You know, one, and this is uh, very important for this time of year, right, is maximizing yield. You've done all this work to get, you know, students into your funnel, but how do we plug the holes to actually get them through to the bottom um, and, and enrolling on campus? So. One example of this is uh, University of Tampa, a great partner of Platform Q Educations for a number of years. Uh, this past year, um, they had a March admitted student event that was actually snowed out in the New England area. Go figure, snow in New England during yield season, who knew? Um, and so what they did is they, they, took, they put in a little bit of extra effort and said, we wanna host a, a dedicated webcast for students um, in the spring focused on uh, yield, right? An online, but essentially an online admitted student reception. Right, so, so what they did is they invited their, their New England students, but they also opened it up to students outside, you know, who throughout, throughout, throughout the rest of the country, because it being online, you have the flexibility to do that. Uh, interestingly, you know, they saw, you know, on average, they see about between 50 to 75 uh, students attend an in-person event. So when they do their regional admitted programs, uh, that's a good average number for them. And online, you know, of course, there's an opportunity for more uh, engagement there because, again, larger geographic distribution, the whole pool. So they saw about 168 attendees. So the number isn't really what's important. What's more, the, the number of attendees here, of course, is great. But what's more important here is that the yield rate on their enrolled student on, on the students who attended their online event was 56% as compared to their institutional average of about 21. 
uh, that I, we did check and that 21% does align with their general um, regional admitted student event program. So the online program really allowed for students to, to have that, that engagement opportunity that they were, they were really hungry for at that phase of the process. So this gives you an idea of what, you know, the, what it looks like you know, they're, they're, when they were presenting on their platform, their colors, their brand. More, but you know, the, what I really want to kind of focus on here is when we look at the, the geographic distribution of the students who attended, you see very heavy representation from the Northeast, which is where their focus was for the event. But then you also saw a great, op a, a great engagement opportunity for students, even in their own backyard. So this is a, you know, one opportunity for you know, students who they may have visited campus already, they're planning on visiting campus later, but they're, they're looking for another opportunity to, to engage with, with the staff and learn more about enrolling at the campus. I know when I, when I was at the University of New Haven, one of the challenges that we had with our on-campus open houses in the spring was we really wanted our open house to be focused on you know, juniors who are starting their search and their fa family. So a lot of the information there is a little bit more general, a little more high level overview. Uh, and we had dedicated admitted student days, but if a student couldn't make it to an admitted student day, inevitably they would say, oh, well, I'm gonna go check out the open house. So we'd have to create kind of a, a on the fly kind of dedicated program for admitted students in the spring for our on-campus events, right? So having another opportunity to engage admitted students in online in addition to the offline programs is a great way to make sure you kind of have students on dedicated tracks. You can focus your content for these presentations on the students you really want to focus them on versus having kind of general content out there and having to kind of dilute the experience for the broader pool because you're trying to serve too many audiences at a specific event. Uh, the, second op the second example we have is you know, post, -ye you know, post yield season, then you've got melt season, right? And you have this desire and this, this, exp this reason to want to make sure that you know, just because a student submitted a deposit doesn't mean they haven't submitted a deposit somewhere else and they're still weighing their options. Um, or that doesn't mean they're not going to have, you know, a negative experience some, somewhere or a positive experience and want to and change their mind, right? A deposit does not equal an enrollment, right? So, so how do we put the freeze on summer melt? Uh, one good example is, you know, University of San Diego, what they do is they have a, a full life cycle engagement plan where they, they start at the general information session all the way through to the pre-orientation, to a pre-orientation workshop so that students are consistently reminded why they're, they're interested in the University of San Diego and why they chose the University of San Diego. And what they saw was a reduction in summer melt by 50% over a two-year period, uh, which is huge, right? When you think about, you know, for anyone who's a, a, a VP of enrollment on the, on the, on the line uh, or is involved in, in the finances and that sort of stuff at the institution, this can, you know, reducing summer melt by 50% can literally mean millions of dollars in net tuition revenue to the institution by, by you know, hitting and exceeding your class. So thinking about the, the best ways to engage and support students throughout that process and really moving from transactional content to transitional, trans, transformational interactions. And what, and what we mean by that is what, what San Diego did is they said, what are things that we can provide in an online environment that students can access live and also on demand and then once they get to campus, have more of that high impact experience. You know, University of San Diego, it's in San Diego. It's a beautiful place. Uh, you don't want to spend all your time sitting in lecture halls, you know, being taught about specific things, student services and programs, if some of those things can be made available on demand and also available to parents and that, that may not be there as well, right? So really incorporating this into, really incorporating online engagement throughout the process and executing throughout to make sure that students are having, having those opportunities. And the last, uh, the last pro, um, strategy we want to talk about is really thinking about that from a continuous engagement program. How do you support, you know, in addition to the San Diego example, how do we support students beyond just the inquiry phase leveraging online tools? And one of the, and a good example of this is, you know, Syracuse University. So, Syracuse University, big, all about their brand. We talked before about, you know, branded content being rated as most trustworthy, video being preferred, and the student voice being influential, right? Syracuse checks off all those boxes consistently throughout the year by hosting presentations throughout the year focused on students talk, sharing their story about their experience within the individual colleges, having admissions counselors speak about the admissions and financial aid process, all on an institutionally branded environment that is, that is then available on demand 24 seven post engagement, right? And when we think about continuous engagement, we think about you know, that, that combination of live and on demand. Uh, you know, this is a, a snapshot of the attendees at Syracuse's admitted student event last year. 
And we see on the left, these, this is where the students attended live, much more global in scope, right, with respect to their outreach uh, than maybe even the Tampa example was. But you see, you know, very, you know, very broad distribution, but a, a great volume of attendees. On the right, you see on demand. And on demand, what's nice about on demand is when, when Syracuse hosts an event, they host a live presentation, but then they keep that presentation live for the week following that presentation. And what they see is about a 50% lift in attendees that may not have attended the live presentation, but come to the uh, on-demand content and then participate in a, a live chat that's scheduled throughout the rest of that week. So they still get that live engagement, but you don't have to worry about presenting the webinar content over and over again throughout the year. I kind of go back to, again, that example of, you know, anybody can host a webinar. I remember hosting webinars a few years ago when I was back at, at, in, in one of my prior admissions roles. And the challenge was is that I, I, you know, let's say I was presenting the financial aid presentation. I'd have to present that presentation the six times we scheduled it to have a live presentation. Now you can present that session one time and then replay it live those six times and rotate who answers the live chat during the, during the live event. So you're not putting all that effort and, and work on one counselor to put in those extra hours. Todd, did you have something you wanted hey, to, Gil, to add? I've got a, yeah, yeah, just real, real quickly. Um, a really good question came in and um, I, again, uh, continue to um, post questions in the, uh, in the chat uh, area and I'll, I'll get those and get those to Gil and, and we'll sort of address those. We've got some other questions that we can, um, that came in before the webinar as Gil indicated, we'll, we'll answer those as well. But the, the question, um, what's the duration of these types of on-demand content? Is it, you know, is it five minutes? Is it 30 minutes, um, an hour, a day? Um, so what, what's, the, what's the typical sort of um, duration for these? Yeah, I mean, I think generally what we recommend is we would say your content should be similar in scope to what you're presenting in an on-campus presentation. Uh, so if it's a presentation about, the, if it's your, you know, Discover University of Toledo, right, presentation where you're presenting a, a, the general information session you would to campus visitors or at the opening of an open house. That's generally probably a 30 to 45 minute presentation, which is, which is kind of that sweet okay. spot, right? Anything longer than that, yep. it's, it's too long of a presentation. Some of this is also the parent engagement play. Parents will probably stick around longer for a live presentation. Uh, but the benefit sure. of the on-demand element to all of this is that students can start and stop at different times and not worry about the presentation going away, right? Like, quite frankly, when we close out of this webinar, you're not going to be able to access the content until we send you the recording link, right? So um, having, having that information all live in the same place and be available in an online environment means that the students are able to access it during that, that period. So it's about that combination of live and on-demand, and then the length is, is uh, really contingent on the content. And then it's just having good speakers, right? And I think admissions counselors and current students are, are two of the best people, uh, best types of people to be representing your institution in this format because it comes across as, as, as real and authentic. Exactly, that's great. Okay, thank you. Cool, yeah, and great keep question. keep the questions coming. Awesome, so the, you know, key takeaways before we open it up for questions and answers, you know, we, we mentioned before, that you know, continuous online engagement yields greater results at each phase of the process, right? We mentioned the, the lift in application conversion, you know, fo info content focused on prospects that haven't yet applied or students who have started but not yet submitted their application. There's great ways to you know, think about strategies for, for boosting conversion at that phase of the funnel. So if, if you're concerned about where your application numbers are you know, earlier in the process, having content focused on those audiences would be a great thing to think about uh, you know, you, you imagine, imagine having a workshop, you know, we had a school, I think it was Boston University last year, had an in, incomplete applicant workshop where they, they invited only the students who had started but not yet submitted their applications to a, an open Q&A. And they had, I want to say, you know, let's say there were 60 students who attended, uh, which, you know, size is, is relative based on the institution, but 60 students coming to that presentation instead of 60 phone calls for the admission staff to have to field. Um, answering questions about submitting the application, right? So it's that type of thoughtful process. Uh, again, you know, deeper in the funnel when you have students who have been admitted but not yet chosen to attend the institution, having a strategy around those, and even students who have said they're coming but haven't quite gotten there yet, um, having a strategy around those. So integrating that in and, and having it be, you know, we, that's where we see that, that lift in results from, from app generation to app completion and full cycle yield. 
Uh, the other thing that I mentioned earlier is, you know, marketing an online event is, is just paradigmatically different than marketing an on-campus event. When you think about your on-campus or, or regional programs, uh, for that matter, you, you do, you know, everybody does the mailer ahead of time, the couple email sequence and those sorts of things, and that makes sense, right? Parents need to, you know, to, depending on where you're marketing to and, and who the parents are or adult learners or whatever, they, whatever the audience is, they have to think about work schedules, they have to think about sports schedules, extracurriculars, travel, booking a hotel, those sorts of things, right? An online event doesn't have those, those challenges. You don't have to book catering for an online event, although you could and just have them deliver coffee to your office maybe, but the, you, don't have to, you don't have to book I want a, the pizza. You know, right, order a pizza during your live session, right? So you don't have to, you don't exactly. have to do, do all that sort of stuff. Right, so marketing an, on, an online event is, is much more in, in, you know, just in time, right, when you think about those sorts of things. And you can promote them via email and text, right? So imagine a world where, you know, a student gets a text message from you that's opted in to receive text that says, hey, admitted student workshop starting, starting now, click here, right, versus having to do all, all this additional. I mean, pre-marketing needs to be a part of it, having, you know, the events on your calendar so your team is prepared and you're marketing them alongside the other events. But your, your pre-event marketing on the individual event level is just different than an on-campus and a regional event. And, you know, as we mentioned, these all, the results for all of these are better when they are aligned with your overall strategic priorities. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, anybody can host a single webinar, but it takes, you know, additional strategic planning and the right software and the right tools to have the best experience for students, the best experience for the presenters, and the best outcomes throughout a process. So that is the uh, so so that those are my key takeaways. Anything you want to add, Todd? Well, I um, the, the the questions are rolling in, Gil. So I'll I'll get to those. I the, the thing that I would sort of emphasize, I guess, for from my perspective and even the the perspective of those of us at, at Ruffalo No Levitt is is the num is number three. The best results come from the appropriate strategic planning. It's a huge reason why. Um, why the conduit platform sort of fits in so well with with a lot of the things that we already do at r and and um, and really our intent um, our to strategically work with institutions and sort of bring all of these kinds of things together. Um, they just both of these sort of platforms or approaches fit fit really, really well. So to me, um, that's what I'm um, probably most excited about, quite honestly, is as we continue to, to partner with, with the Conduit uh, sort of platform and the, the, the folks that can think about this from a strategic standpoint, how to really help leverage all of this for, for campus institutions and sort of where and how they are communicating with, with students and parents. Um, I say that quickly because I, I want to, um, and yes, if you are and want some more information, um, go ahead and, and um, click on uh, the, if you are interested, let us know. We'll certainly let, you know, connect with you all on an individual basis and sort of talk about your specific institution and how this might work. Um, I'm super excited to get to some of these questions, uh, Gil. I, there's a there's a lot of them coming your way, um, and we'll even get to the to the part about hey, if there's an opportunity for all of you to think about sort of how you want to uh, think about your strategic plan and where all of this comes from, it would not be um, a Ruffalo No Levitz uh, uh, sort of webinar if we didn't have an event coming up and we wouldn't want any of you as attendees to think about going. Um, the end of March, uh, we've got a strategic enrollment planning forum in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I think, I hope, but by then the snow and the cold, cold weather will be gone. So it'll be a great time to visit. And um, there's an opportunity for, uh, for those of you who uh, would like to attend to um, using the code below STEP100, get, uh, get $100 off of your um, uh, registration fee for that. So the the questions, Gil. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort yeah. of um, throw some of these at you and let you um, let you sort of answer these uh, one at a time. So one, um, uh, do any any of the schools that uh, that the platform Q Education um, uh, folks, you guys and through Conduit, do you any of your schools use this for delivering online orientation? Uh, I thought that was a good a, a very good question. Absolutely. So. Not a, I, I would not recommend a full orientation via the platform because there is that element of 
um, you know, getting the feeling of fit on campus and getting that feeling when a student steps on campus for the, you know, for, for a full orientation. But I think going to that example of University of San Diego, taking, um, you know, taking the, the elements that, that, that you want to make sure are reinforced pre and post orientation, things like, you know, student services and residential life programming and student activities, things that, you know, students might want to refresh themselves on afterwards, hosting a really solid, they call it their summer series, um, is a great way to, to seal the deal with those admitted students and, and provide that kind of pre-orientation experience. Uh, Notre Dame a couple years ago uh, did one as well. Um, so having that, you know, having that kind of plan in place, and our, our team is happy to help with the strategies around that, the promotion strategies around it, how to, you know, make sure the audience is driven there at the right time ahead of time. Uh, the, you know, Yield and Summer Melt is, is a really great sweet spot for the, for the use of the conduit platform and the, and the strategies around it because it's, you know, it's, it's focusing on those students, the students who you, you really want to make sure you're, you're engaging and supporting throughout the process. So I would say not a full orientation. I wouldn't recommend it for, as, a, as a full strategy, but it's a great way to, to give the content that you want to have more legs, more legs, right? So that's a, it's a great question. That's great. Um, another one, it, it, this is, uh, and, and there's a couple of different questions along the same line, really sort of in terms of tracking uh, demographics and understanding who is on the on-demand piece of this, um, who's tuning into these? You know, is it, do we have the ability or do you have the ability to track, is it students? Is it, you know, sort of more, more parents who are, who are going on to these? Uh, what, what kind of reporting maybe on the back end can you yeah. help provide the institution? Totally. And this is a quick plug for that poll about clicking to say that you're interested in discussing strategies because I'd love <laughs> to, to answer yeah. specific questions directly for sure. Um, there's also a video on the website that you see there, platformqed.com slash conduit. Don't go there yet because you're, you're on a live webinar. But um, I would say that, you know, the, <laughs> the, what's nice about the way the, the strategies are developed is, you know, when we're focusing on the students that are in your bucket, right, the ones that are leaking out and you're trying to plug those holes, is you've got the data that on the, on the audience you want to market to. You know, first name, last name, email address, and cell phone number when they've opted in for text are what we need to promote an event. We've also just recently, and our PR team would kill me for announcing it on a webinar, but I'm going to do it anyway, um, is the ability to also log unique CRM IDs with the records that you import into the platform, right? So when you export your live attendee events, when you export your on-demand attendee events, now you can map that right back into your CRM without having any types of challenges with respect to duplicate records, uh, which is always a problem when you have outside, you know, software separate from your CRM. Um, and, you know, one of the downsides of like a, of, you know, of other platforms like a, like a WebEx or, a, or GoToMeeting, et cetera, is you can't, you can't ask those, you, you'll get those types of questions. Um, the other element to this is from a tracking perspective is one of the tools within this, within the Conduit platform, and I, you know, again, click that button so we can do an actual demo, but um, is we, we generate what we call a Q token, which, because it's platform Q, everything has to have a Q in it. The, uh, we have the, a Q token is essentially a direct login URL that's appended to every record of the students you want to invite to your event. So typical webinar platform, I mean, you went through the experience registering for this webinar, you go to, you, you, get, an, you get an email invitation, you have to fill out a form, submit the form, and even to, to access the recording, sometimes you have to fill out another form. And students don't like forms, right? I think that's one common message that we hear uh, with things like the e-expectations report and others is that, you know, the more fields you have, the lower the completion rate is on, on different forms, right? So if you're doing an admitted student event, an admitted student webcast or a, uh, you know, an incoming student webcast, you've got the information you need for a student to attend one of those webinars. So why add that friction? Why not just send a student a direct link to access the presentation? So maybe you send them a save the date calendar invite which, you know, I don't know how many students go through the effort of adding something to a calendar. Uh, so that's why you follow up with the email with the, the morning of or the right when it's starting, hey, click here to access a webcast. And, you know, goes through, the, through text and through email. Uh, so, that, so what's nice about that QToken link is that all the activity that, that the person, who, that, that that student does on the platform, how long they watch the presentation, what questions they ask, what poll questions they respond to, all of those things are tracked at the record level so that that can inform your follow-ups afterwards. So you get a post-event report that, again, you can import back into your CRM with the ID attached. Um, 
You get on-demand reporting of anybody who accesses the presentation after the live period, chat logs if they participate in a, in a live website chat that can all be logged back in, and then you can use that data to inform your follow-up communications, follow-up workflows, predictive models potentially, depending on what questions you ask in the polls, are all things that you can do. So from a data you get perspective, it's all about what you ask during the poll questions and, and, the, and the content and, and who you're inviting. But from a, uh, so, so that's, that's kind of the high level on the activity. Does that answer a lot of those questions, Todd? Yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's pretty good. And, and questions continue to, to come in. So another one, um, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, so, um, but, but maybe just go into a little bit more is how do you propose sort of marketing an online event? And um, the follow-up to that is, um, you know, we, we've started live chats with current students. We're not getting students, you know, at least in math to attend, maybe only two to three sort of per chat. So maybe some things to sort of increase that, that attendance in those online chats that, that institutions have. Absolutely, yeah, and I think those sense? are one of, yeah, I think those, those questions are definitely linked in, in many respects. I think yeah. driving, you know, this is, this is where the strategy piece comes in, right? Like you could, you can use, you know, Facebook Live or whatever to host an event, but if you don't have a proper promotion campaign set up in place in the first place, then it, then it really adds friction to the, to the event, right? So one way to market is one, don't have a, you know, is bypass the registration process for, the vast majority of the people you want to attend by having that direct login link and just sending it to them directly. Uh, two, I think, is you know on on the fly promotion, um, not not on the fly like you're just making it up as you go, but having it be uh, tied to the timing of the event. Right? When you think about having a webcast or a chat, like let's say you're hosting a live chat on your website or on the Conduit platform, you know having that direct login link to access the content is going to be a great way to reduce the friction versus requiring first name last name email whatever when they when they want to access it um, the other is you know making sure that it's a part of your overall calendar right when you have when you have your event your events calendar on your website you've got your open house you've got your um, deadlines for, for applications you've got all of your regional events to register for those sorts of things you can add online events as as events that are coming up um, and you can, in the, so then there's a reg flow element to that for people who aren't getting the invite directly. There's your lead gen element to all this, right, is by having students register for the event via the form. But anybody who you just want to invite from your audience, you send that direct login link to. So I think specifically for, so that, that's how we, you know, uh, that, at a high level from a, a marketing and online event strategy perspective is kind of throwing out the playbook when it comes to promoting a regional event or an on-campus event and making it much more tighter when it comes to, you know, having it be a evergreen part of your calendar so that people are aware and they see it, listing it along on up to upcoming events. But then from a live event, you know, execution perspective, it's, you know, day, as the event's starting, sending out that text or email to the students who you want to attend. You know, day before, two days before, having, having a reminder, you know, and then a week before versus two weeks before, a month before, you know, everybody that has the open houses, you have your, your mailer that goes out a month ahead of time, you don't need to have that mailer necessarily to promote an online event. Although you could print a Q token on a postcard if you wanted to, which is another alignment that RNL and, and, and Platform Q have is, is the alignment of those strategies. How do you incorporate an online event into a phone call campaign as a follow and a follow up to a survey? These are all things that we work with the RNL team to do. Um, as far as a specific chat, and this will be the last piece on this on this part is, uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, take a look at the promotion strategy for it and take a look at the user experience. If there, if it's a clunky user experience, that's for sure going to impact uh, attendance because if it's hard to use, students aren't going to use it. You know, the expectations data, one in 10 students will cross the school off their list if they have a bad website experience. Um, I think the same is going to go to web engagement opportunities. If it's clunky and, and hard to use, there's friction, then they're going to bail and go to and do something else. Um, also, mobile friendly is the is the site chat tool mobile friendly? If it's not, that's probably going to impact things as well. Those are um, those are great great responses, great answers to those. Um, other um, we've we've got certainly we've got time for you know, <laughs> probably two or three, maybe four more questions here. Um, one just in general, and and we we've, we've touched on or you touched on three different institutions, sort of uniquely different times of the year, but one of the questions is, when's the best time to hold these events? Um, and I, I, 
um, I would see these as sort of in my mind, sort of from a calendar perspective, what would you say is sort of the best time to hold these events throughout throughout the year? I think I know what your answer is going to be, but I'll, <laughs> but I'll let you answer it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you said it, right? I think it's throughout the year, right? I think that that's the, yeah. um, you know, I think aligning it with your, your on, on campus and regional events and deadlines and those sorts of things, right? I think it's, um, you know, you know, if you're a Common App school, you know when the Common App goes live. You know, school, if you want to see more conversion out of your Common Apps, invite your, your incomplete applicants to a, a Common App workshop where you're focusing on, you know, your supplement or answering questions about the process. Um, if you don't, if you're not a Common App school, you have your own online application, you know, not all online applications are the most user-friendly. I think everybody in a, in a private moment, if they have a, a one that's not their favorite, they would say that, you know, it's not their favorite, it's hard to use. So maybe there's some triage work you can do if you don't control that element, but you can control coaching students through the process. Even silly things like, oh, the next button is below the fold when you scroll down, you have to scroll all the way to the right-hand corner. Like answering those types of questions in an online environment helps because students can go right to it and finish it, right? So I would say it's, it's more about looking at what is your goal and then and if, it, if it's to boost application conversion, then the types of programs you're going to host are going to be different than if it's to alleviate summer melt, right? But there's a, there's a use case for online programming throughout the entire life cycle. Um, could, well, yep, I knew that was going to be your answer, and I, t <laughs> I totally agree. I, I think, um, and again, it, to me, this is, this is, again, one of those ways where you, um, you, you look at from an overall strategic perspective, how do I best communicate or, or engage with my prospective students? Uh, you know, my, my whole premise back when I was um, in, in charge of enrollment at the institution I was at was students want to be wanted uh, at, at the end of the day. And this, this is one of those things where um, you have an opportunity, again, to sort of strategically place this into your overall campaign and have these kinds of events, as Gil said, throughout the entire year. Um, I, I think there's, there's great applications really at every point in, in the, uh, the proverbial funnel, if, if you will. Um, some, some other questions, and, and I apologize to some if I, if I've missed one along the way, we will definitely get back to you. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm just trying to get to these in order, but they're coming in fast and fast and furious here. Um, one is really more around sort of online videos. So online videos seem like a great way to provide information. What would you then consider priorities when dealing live with a student? Um, I, I don't know if you've got some thoughts on that uh, as well, Gil. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to assume that we're talking about um, going live, like you having a student, you know, present live. Is that how you're reading? That, that's sort of what I'm thinking, and and or or a staff member sort of present live. So that in, in my mind, that that's how I'm viewing this this question as well. Yeah, I mean, I live is definitely always going to be a a great way to have that content. I mean, even think about, we mentioned, I mentioned, you know, social streaming and that sort of stuff as, as an enhancement to the conduit platform. What's nice about when you're presenting live on, say, a social media channel is the, the algorithms that they're using now to, to prioritize presenting of content in notifications is live video is, is, is really what reigns supreme right now. So taking your, like, let's say you have a, a, a student panel where you want to use that not only to engage your juniors who are getting to ready to start the application process, but you also want to generate some eyeballs on that content, right? Like I mentioned before, Facebook Live, you're only going to be able to know who watched the presentation and who clicked the like button, but there's also there's benefits to having that broader visibility, right? Just like digital marketing, you might not necessarily know who clicked one specific ad at the end of the day, but it helped, it, it, you can look at the boost in the overall, in, you know, conversion to the class, right? So. I would say that you know taking that content live is is definitely a is definitely a way to boost in time engagement and so you know when when we stream off of conduit through and extend to Facebook and Twitter and YouTube we see you know great you know live you know metrics live engagement metrics um, on on those efforts and I would say that you know so from a you know from a leveraging the students perspective the 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 nice thing is that in addition to presenting live, then the content is also available to be presented 
sim you live is what we like like I said we call it where you can then present it as a live presentation again you know six months later and have a live chat associated with the presentation so that the students who had who didn't have the opportunity to see that content because they weren't in your funnel before or whatnot you now have the ability to leverage that content without having to ask the same students to, to do the same thing they did six months ago right so it's a great way to make the most out of the effort behind all that content by take anything that you present live, leveraging it for new prospects on a simu live basis throughout the rest of the funnel. That's great. Um, what I, I, I might uh, I might answer just a couple of these real quickly as well, and I've got a, a, a good question for you that actually came in before uh, before today's webinar um, in sort of the the pre the pre-registration process, but um, one, um, someone had asked, uh, which, which is good for you and I to be thinking about, what, what is Platform Q, are they the parent company to Conduit? So, um, and I'll speak for you, Gail, but Conduit is the platform. Platform Q is the, is the company. Is that, can I, is that yep. okay if I answer that it. for you, Gail? You okay. got it. Yep. All right, good. All right, good. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and, and then a couple of other uh, questions that have come in. Let me see if I can get back to it. Um, if we are sending uh, students or, or wh whoever your constituent, if you're sending them a direct login link and are not using Conduit, how do I, how can I track who is in attendance? My initial reaction is, well, you should just be using Conduit, but that's maybe too, too strong of a <laughs> plug. I, if, I, if you're familiar with other ways in which people might, uh, might track in attendance. If you could answer that, maybe uh, I'm gonna give you maybe 30 seconds to sort of quickly answer that, and then I've got one last question to get to here. Yeah, I mean, I would say our, our direct login links are part of the Conduit platform. So they're generated from Conduit and then drive the student to the event that you're promoting, right? So, so they're one and the same at that respect. So you wouldn't, use a, you wouldn't use a Q token to send them to another web page or another platform. Uh, because it's the the point the point of the Q token is to bypass any registration process and then enable all the tracking that happens on the platform as they engage with the content. Gotcha. Um, so one of the questions that that we um, that we had prior to today's webinar was uh, rebuilding our communication plan from scratch. And and whoever you are. Um, Kudos to you, and, and we wish you the best of luck. Um, <laughs> but hoping to make our funnel an experience for the student, not a net uh, help. And, I, and so I, maybe that's more of a, a comment than a question. Um, first of all, what I would say, the most important sort of word that I pulled out of, of all of this is experience. I love that, that, that this institution is, is thinking about how to make it an experience for the student. Um, again, I, to me, this is where sort of the strategic integration of, of sort of all channels and all ways in which to, uh, to engage with the student and his or her parents is, uh, is something that's, that's massively important. Um, I, anything to sort of add to that on that, Gil? No, no, I would say the only, I mean, from a tactical piece, I would say going back to what we talked about before, having you know a good combination it goes back to the, the whole hole in the bucket thing from the beginning right your yeah. mail email phone letters you know mar digital marketing are all going to be part of a a a recruitment and marketing strategy webcast social streaming and chat need to be other communication channels just like telephone and letters and, and advertising right so it's you know building out a thoughtful plan of incorporating and aligning all of those things together we have a number of institutions uh, that you know, Platform Q and RNL are working together on right now to, to align all mm -hmm. those strategies together. Um, and it's easier to do it when you're doing it at the strategic level than trying to tack on pieces here and there, right? Otherwise, you're never gonna have the right length straw to patch the holes in your bucket, right? So I would say that you know, thinking through that and, 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 and saying you know, if, we're, if we're at that phase, it's really important to get synced on all of those things in, at, at, you know, at, the, at the beginning than to try to add, you know, new, uh, try to tack things on as we go. Exactly. Well, um, th there are still more questions and we are up at the top of the hour. Um, uh, both Gil and I will do our best here in the next uh, 24 to 48 hours to get to everyone who still had questions 
Um, this was um, maybe the most sort of in interactive and engaged uh, group on a webinar I've been a part of in a long, long time. So um, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, for sticking around for this past hour. This has been, uh, or at least from my perspective, great, and um, love the content, love the questions and the and the comments. So with that. Um, I'll let Gil sign off as well, but really appreciate uh, all of you sticking around and uh, attending this webinar with Gil and I today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Thank you, everybody. And now you can go to that website you see on the screen and watch the really cool video that our, <laughs> that our designers spent hours and hours and hours and hours on. So we hope you like it. <laughs> exactly. Thanks again, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everybody.